Hey, Uh, welcome to the Real Estate Brainstorming Podcast, episode zero. My name is Ryan Huggins. I will be one of your co-hosts today. Another great week in the books for real estate. So we're going to talk about what happened in the past week and also great things coming forward with the real estate market. We're going to have so many great topics coming for you guys, and we're very, very grateful that you are here to take a listen. So again, my name is Ryan Huggins. I live in Laguna Beach, California, born and raised here in California, and uh, been in real estate now for two years. My first year, I was an asset manager for a real estate investor, really, really grinded and learned so much real estate in that first year and uh, wanted to make a transition, wasn't really enjoying that type of real estate myself. So I made the transition over to residential real estate and I have absolutely loved it. So uh, when I first got involved with residential, I had a great mentor and they were able to kind of get me kickstarted. But the one thing that I was missing was leads. So I bought a lead generation course to become a real estate marketer myself. And so I did create my own real estate marketing company that went really well. But when I realized that I should be making the larger commissions, I went ahead and just started keeping my leads for myself. And uh, that has been an amazing journey. So over 4 million in sales now in my first full year as a residential real estate agent. And uh, it's really, really exciting. And my co-host, Mr. Tom Phelan, and he is coming to you guys today from the Key West Florida, also about to move to California. So Tom, if you will, uh, come on in and introduce yourself. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Uh, It's chilly here today. It's about 88. (laughs) Uh, Key West, Florida. I can sit at the southernmost point and wave to Raul Castro in Cuba. But uh, I am moving to California. My wife got a tremendous opportunity for a job. I'm familiar with California. I'm familiar with Los Angeles. I uh, grew up there, uh, definitely know Laguna Beach, uh, beautiful, beautiful area. So I'm anxious to come out there and really start working with you face to face, so to speak. Uh, my background goes back in sales over 35 years of m- many types of things. I've been a Smith Barney stockbroker, licensed in insurance. Uh, I have a law degree. Uh, I love to read a lot about uh the things that are, are trending or how they're progressing. And without a doubt, real estate is one of them. I mean, it's hardly a day go by. I don't get alerts of uh, 1031 exchange rules might change or how's the market, which we'll get into a little. Uh, how's the market trending right now? What do we see down the road? What's a little bit more unusual about it? What can a realtor do? Uh, and it all boils down to, uh, I don't know who would disagree with this. It's leads, leads, leads. And if you probably have a deep, deep pocketbook that can afford two or three grand a month, that's not quite the problem for you. But for many realtors, that's the furthest thing from the truth. So where do you think the market's going? Well, it is definitely a seller's market in my area and many areas across the country. We've been dealing with it. Uh, Several of my buyers have had some really great experiences with having to stick it out. I mean, uh, real estate is a lesson in perseverance right now. And uh, I, I just helped a client. We officially closed on Thursday of last week. She got the keys and everything was really Congrats. exciting. Yeah, thank you very much. And she act- I started working with her in December. And yep. um, we have gone through numerous different situations. She was a three hundred fifty to $450,000 or $400,000 buyer. Um, very competitive market, more of the townhouse condo type of client here in Orange County. Um, but we even started dabbling in Riverside and Corona. Uh, right. we, had, we had one contract out in, uh, we, we ended up getting bidding war in Riverside. We had one we thought we were going to lock down, but they actually outbid us in Riverside by $110,000 on this home. And they ended up paying all cash. And um, wow. It was a fixer next to a train track. So I was like, wow, (laughs) no joke. She ended up taking a break for a week. I called it a break. She said, I quit. (laughs) I was like, right. Not unusual. Yeah. So I was like, hey, I completely understand. I I know you want to take a break. So I let her have a week off. My auto emails, my auto emails kept coming in and uh, I found some really good property. And I was like, you've got to take a look at this one and re-motivated her. And uh, a couple months later, we finally got one. So that's really exciting. Well, you know, what you say is so true. And I've read a lot of articles and talked to a lot of realtors on the ground. 
uh, a, a buyer gets discouraged. They go, what's the point? Every time I lose out and you don't want to naively or wrongly for your client say, well, just go in and offer something outrageous. That's not the answer. Uh, it takes a lot of stick to it, isn't it? And that, that good for you. I'll tell you, there's a ripple effect to the seller's market. We were mentioning it earlier, the renter's market. Uh, someplace, I know New York City for sure, is there's rental wars now yeah. that uh, a landlord is getting two, three, five offers over asking rent because there's people that want to jump aboard. Also, uh, they're signing longer leases, like up to two years. They want to lock in that rate. So for buyers, I boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's a tough one when they say, should I wait? Should I sit on the fence for sellers? Will it get higher or will it suddenly pop and not fall? But what they could have got last week is not what they can get now. And yeah, the price is down where you are. Uh, that can be substantial. 10% drop can be a quarter million dollars yeah. uh, easily. Like you're dealing with someone at 354. A lot of Laguna Beach, as you know, I'm going after is uh, down here as well. They're $2 million, two and a half, $3 million homes. Uh, a lot of them with high appreciation. I don't say equity because you could have paid it off over time. I'm talking about equity, but also appreciation over decades that mm -hmm. you see they paid a half million. It's worth two and a half million. And we'll talk a bit about that. Yeah, well, literally last year, um, obviously going through and learning all the real estate stuff, I started doing more research on the market. Laguna Beach last year, uh, Central Laguna Beach. So you have North, South, and Central Laguna Beach. So Central Laguna Beach, homes averaging right at $2.1 million last year. Right wow. now, the same homes are $2.3 million plus. And uh, I was even looking at the rental market, like you said here, um, cause I have a client that came in that wants to, uh, lease. Right. And so I was like, Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I, I help people lease in the area. Let me go take a look. Cause I haven't looked at leases in a while. I've just been working with a lot of buyers and sellers. And so the least expensive home, which was like 1100 square feet was $10,000 a month huh. in, oh. in the central Laguna area. And I was just, yeah. I was just blown away. I was like, wow, you know, that's a, like usually $10,000 a month could get you something that your family could live in. But this is like what basically, you know, it's a thousand dollar, thousand square foot, one bedroom, uh, one bath. It's like, it's crazy in these little bungalows right here, specifically in Laguna. But I mean, the city is the most amazing city. It's like, it's just different, kind of like Key West, you know, it's one of those unique yes. places on the, uh, in the country. So you, you get what you pay for as well, for sure. I almost opened an art gallery in Laguna Beach uh, quite a ways back. But yeah, I know the town. It's a quaint, quaint town. In fact, I had a dear friend that had a chance to buy uh, a haagen franchise. I forget. I don't know if it was on the highway, but it's one of the busy intersecting streets. And she said, I don't know if I'll make it or not. It was like 200 grand. This is a little decades ago. Right. And I said, she had the money. I said, jump on it. Grab it. Because franchise meaning it wasn't built yet. Yeah, uh, uh, and sell it. Get it up there for a year and sell it. She didn't do it. Whoever bought it, like quadrupled their money, and it was just a cash cow. Yeah, most of the year there's there's a hundred people in line waiting to get ice cream. That's a, that that is just amazing. But knowing Laguna Beach and how expensive it can be is something we're going to touch on. It will be about maybe should you do something with that equity or as you know there are people in laguna beach of course the kids are growing with the college uh they, they have careers maybe they moved out of state and the parents are saying we don't really need a four bedroom three bath whatever uh house anymore less downsize what are my options and i think this is one of the weakest areas for a lot of realtors they don't understand that they do have options they can do what i call a residential 1031 exchange uh, don't look it up in IRS. Nothing exists like that. But if you go to any intermediary, they will have uh, probably a fact sheet on uh, exchanging personal residence. It's a little different, little nuanced, but it does fit for some people, not all, but for some. And any area that has high appreciation, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, whatever, uh, even down here, uh, it, it's something that should be discussed by a realtor. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, we talked the other day about this specifically 1031 exchange. And uh, tell me that one story about uh, the person who ended up selling 
uh, was it they were looking to buy a farm or something like that? Yes. What, what, yeah. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, this happened in Colorado, and it could happen anywhere in the country. And uh, a Remax agent had the couple as a lead. He got on the phone, I believe, and he asked me to come in on a Saturday morning and meet them. And I did. And they were there waiting for me. They're probably in their 70s. And they were just tickled pink because they stopped at a Denny's and had a Grand Slam for $3.99 or something. They just thought, <laughs> what a bargain. Anyway, they had had this property since time zero. Their grandparents had homesteaded about 20,000 acres in Colorado. Wow. And they had, I believe, about 2,000 left. Their parents had sold off some. They had sold off some. And its value was about two and a half million dollars. And they wanted to buy a smaller ranch, smaller acreage, but substantial, 400, 500 acres in Nebraska. And they were suddenly confronted with what are they going to have to pay in capital gains tax? And back then it was 20%, no exceptions. And they wanted to talk to me. So in talking to them, I like to think I'm a solution finding guy. I said, what is it you want to do? And they said, well, we want to acquire that farm, but it's only about eight, 900,000. And yeah. according to you, we're going to have almost a million and a half exposure to tax 20%. That's $300,000. I said, what about your children? Tell me about it. Well, they had a son who was a lawyer who just graduated and he would love to have his own office his own little condo office that you can buy. And I said, okay, uh, has he ever checked it out? And they said, well, we looked at some things with him and that was about five to 600,000 for you know, like 700 square foot for a little office. And then we have a daughter that she does hair, cosmet cosmetologist, I guess. She does hair, uh, doesn't really want to continue to do that, but she likes the business. She likes talking to people and having clientele, whatever. And she rents a chair at a, a local salon and it's up for sale. Boy, we'd sure like it if she could buy that, but she doesn't have the money. And I said, how much is it? And I can't remember the figures, but it was reasonably high. And I said, well, what if you sold, exchange, got your farm, all cash paid for it, paid cash for your son's office. He paid you fair market rent and paid cash for the salon where your daughter now owned it and managed it. She didn't have to do hair. And would that be a plan? And they couldn't believe that could be done. They said, and no taxes. I said, no, you don't have to pay any taxes. Your children have to pay for our market rent. Well, what if they can't afford it right now? Well, what you do then is you gift them the money. They put it into a checking account. They didn't write you a check for the fair market rent, which is okay. And they pay you and that's fine. When you die, they inherit on a stepped up basis. Bingo, it was done. So that's just one example of it. It could have been a muffler shop. Yeah. It could have been whatever, okay, of, of thinking outside the box. Well, I know the first time that you covered that with me, like that's why I had to talk about the story again. It literally, like my mind was exploding yeah. because you're totally right. A lot of people don't know that they can use Tim. I didn't even know. I'm so glad I you know, was chatting with you and learned about the 1031 exchange and being able to actually buy a property and then buy a couple like sell a property and use the proceeds to buy other properties and not get taxed on it and i had heard through the grapevine of working with realtors i remember working or not with realtors but with investors i remember them talking about oh i'm going to do a 1031 exchange on this and for me it just meant that they needed to buy another property it didn't right. i didn't realize that they were using it for a business purpose and i was like wow okay this is really cool and so I'm so glad that you were able to, you know, shed some light on that. And also, like, if anyone out there that's listening wants to get some more light on that, uh, you can definitely reach out to us. The contact information will be in the description, and uh, we'll uh, definitely let you get some help from that. Now, the well, other thing... You, I'm sorry. Well, let me give you another quick example. Sure. Uh, it, it's so obvious. It's not obvious. You talk to someone, they're all excited. The kid's going out to college. Maybe they're looking at beach or they live in Newport, whatever. They've done okay have a house worth a few dollars and they also have a rental maybe grandma died or they acquired it it happens uh, i've seen a divorce and they later they get remarried and that that they keep the house as a rental unit anyway child goes off to uh pennsylvania or new york or new jersey whatever goes off to college and of course boarding is always uh, a question where do they live uh, who picks up the tab and someone could take a rental property they have in 
Laguna, uh, Newport, wherever it could be in, uh, frankly, it could be in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Their child's going to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and they go, they buy, sell that rental, they buy a rental in Philadelphia. The daughter pays fair market rent, which again, they gift to her the money to do that. I've seen it where they even the daughter has a couple friends, roommates in it. And so they help subsidize it. And she uses that money to live on. Okay. And they do that for the four years or for some children today, five years to get to a college degree. Yeah. And uh, when they graduate, unless you're going to stay in that town, the parents then sell it in exchange is something back in Laguna Beach or the prices are such a difference somewhere else that's affordable. They don't have, they're not stuck with it having to be in Philadelphia. And I've seen people do this and just say, I, I just did not know that. I've never heard that that was an option. Yeah, and so for a realtor listening and uh, if they're listening into the podcast and learning from this, with the 1031 exchange and doing that, what would be like the first, who would be the go-to person that a realtor would want to talk to about learning? Like who, who would they talk to, to get a 1031? Cause they're not obviously doing it themselves. Who would they talk right. to or have their clients talk to, to help that happen? Well, I'll say me because of the fact that I've done so many and, and come up with solutions for so many different scenarios uh, for information, they can go to a 1031 exchange intermediary. They're more reluctant because they're, of course, trying to cover their backside and don't want to get into maybe something that's that, I don't want to say exotic, but a little more complex than just sell it and find something in the same town, same block and go and exchange into it, uh, what have you. Okay. Now, for example, uh, I don't know how many realtors, because it's been a while since I've been in residential and with inflation, houses are fetching enormous prices. If I sat down with someone listing a property and it was two and a half million in Laguna Beach and they had paid 350 to five 25 years ago, I would have to let them know that they probably are going to be subject to capital gains tax. And sometimes they'll look at you and go, what? Yeah. Well, I heard there's that, that, that the exemption. Well, they're talking about IRS section 121, which is a quarter million for single or widowed, 500,000 for a married couple. So say they paid 500,000 and now they get a half million dollar exemption. That's a million. And the house sells for two and a half million. Okay, that's a million and a half of potential gains that could be a couple hundred thousand dollars in taxes. And they're not prepared for that. So even if they don't want to do an exchange or even enter that realm, I think a realtor has the responsibility to say, maybe you want to check with your CPA, you want to check the tax implications, whatever. Maybe you want to do a 1031 exchange. And I'll conclude this thought. You cannot exchange a home that you live in, but you can move out and rent it for a year. Two years is better year and a half is better than one, but over one year with the intent of using it as a rental. Don't have a little buyer lined up and that's why lease options you don't get into because it's an intent, it's on paper that the owner will sell it. No, you're gonna do a rental. And after it's been there a year, you then can exchange that house with all of its profits, take it into other property or properties. Yeah. Okay, now, the double whammy. If they rent those for two years, they can move back into it and convert it back to a residence. So yeah, you'd have to rent somewhere, buy somewhere else, go to Europe, <laughs> whatever. You'd have to kill some time, but it is there. So maybe it's one out of a hundred people, one out of a thousand, but there are some people saying, well, we are, we're going to go to Europe for a year. We're going to go here. We're going to go on. A, we're going to do this. That might actually work. Uh, at least it's something they can think about. Well, let me ask you this then. So let's say we have a client who is, they have their, their home it does have uh, $1.5 million equity. Um, could they then take a home equity loan out on that home, buy a new property to go live in for a year, and then use the original subject property as a rental after that? That gets a little more uh, uh, complicated because they have to move out to create it, create a uh, 
proof that it's a rental. Getting a HELOC loan, I'd be a little hesitant as a realtor to suggest that because are they telling the lender who's giving a HELOC loan that's really their intention? Got to turn it into a rental. They may frown on that. I don't know. Okay. Let's take this example. They do do an exchange. And let's just take business property. Ryan, you own a single family home in Newport that you rent. It's done well with appreciation. Okay. And now you turn around, you sell it, and you exchange into a unit wherever. Okay. First thing you do, you didn't even close. Paperwork's not even dry, the ink, and you go out and refinance that unit and pull cash out of it. They're probably going to bust that 1031. If IRS picks up on it, they'll, they'll disallow it. You have to hold it for a year. Got it. Okay. okay. Cool. Right. So I'm just trying to give you that, that HELOC kind of makes it there might be a workable way. Absolutely, they can borrow and stay in that house and buy a piece of property. Yeah. Okay, that okay. makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, and they could it maybe downsize later, move into it, convert it to a, a residence. Uh, they could do a reverse mortgage. I had mentioned I wanted to talk about that quickly, and I know that's the Darth Vader of mortgages for a lot of realtors. They oh, they spook and whatever. Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, like I said, I had had a Series Sevens license. I sold for Smith Barney. You'd see realtors never suggest anything about real estate ever. I'm sorry, realtors. It's a cold, hard truth. They're not your friends, okay? They want every dime by Mr. and Mrs. America to go into Wall Street funds so they can earn commissions. I can't say I blame them. But anyway, that's the way it is. So they're not going to say, well, Ryan, you know, you put a million dollars in the S&P and this and that, whatever. Maybe that extra quarter million you have, why don't you maybe buy some rental property? They're, they're not going to say that because they don't earn commissions and they're not set up to do it. They might suggest a REIT at most, okay? But when Ryan gets ready to retire and your retirement is short, Wall Street didn't live up to what they estimated. And instead of five grand a month, you're going to get 3,500. Guess what they turn to to supplement your income? Well, Ryan, you have a home. Why don't we do a reverse mortgage? They're right there to suggest that. And I think that's insulting in a way that they, they don't talk about it or they badmouth it. But boy, when that worked for you, they're the first ones to say, let's go tap the equity in that home. Now, you said something that I, I just want to make it crystal clear. Someone could pay $2 million for a home and pay it off in 30 years, let's say. That's equity. If the house is appreciated, that's what's taxable. Got it. Okay. Got it. Two different things. I'm talking about like in Laguna Beach, you know, people who paid 500000 and 20 years later, it's worth $2 million. Yeah. Appreciation. Now, whether they, if, and this will happen, but they refine for a million nine. That's a whole different kettle of fish. Okay. Doesn't mean they can't do it, but it's a whole different thing. Okay. Awesome. Uh, because when you exchange, a lot of people don't understand this. And I won't, I won't go into great depth now. When people exchange, it's got to be like kind, real estate for real estate. And that's a big myth in real estate. It doesn't have to be a home for a home or a duplex for a duplex. It can be a, quad, a fourplex for a lot, a, a piece of land somewhere. It can be all kinds of combinations. But the mortgage on the property you relinquish, you sell, must be carried forward to the property you buy. So if you sell a home and you have a million dollar mortgage, you got to have a million dollar mortgage on the house you buy. If you don't, that's called mortgage boot. So if you had a million dollar mortgage and the property you went into, you only had $600,000 worth of a mortgage, you'd have $400,000 taxable. And that's done, should be done on an individual basis, whatever. We won't tie up the time to do that now. But that's why a mortgage can be so important. And how does it play out? Excellent. So when we are talking about in our area specifically, well, actually nationwide, because of the fact with our realtor network of over 54,000 people, if someone wants to learn more about that, definitely get in touch with Tom and we can go into more details. Now, we also just mentioned a little bit about, like you said, the Darth Vader of all things, right? The reverse mortgage. So let's right. talk a little bit more about this. So, um, it, you know, unfortunately, in the very beginning of the the uh, reverse mortgage. There was a lot of preying on innocent oh, people. Senior, that had no idea. Yep. 
They had no idea what it was about. But now, okay. as you were just talking to me uh, before our call today, you have seen a huge turnaround in the reverse mortgage uh, industry altogether. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. It, it can be a $300,000 house. And your grandmother is not uh, has no mortgage and her taxes because she bought it, you know, and her husband passed away uh, are minimal. 500 a year, 1,000 a year, because they bought it 30, 40 years ago. But your grandmother sure would like to have that hip surgery, or she'd like to have uh, a big screen TV, and I'm being sincere, or she'd like to redo her kitchen, maybe even put a ramp in or a handicap, whatever. But she doesn't want to sell the nest, and she doesn't want to do a loan on it, have to pay, have a mortgage payment. Even yeah. two, three hundred a month may be too much for her because she's dependent on Social Security. Well, at 62, you can borrow 50 percent. At 70, it's up to about 60 percent, 75 years old. So let's just say she can borrow 50 percent. The house is worth 300. She can borrow 150,000. Now, she can use it like a HELOC as a cookie jar to go to, draw from. Or she can take a cash advance, the whole two, uh, 50% of 300000 or she can take payments. They have to uh, crunch the numbers, but maybe that's 250 a month or 300 a month, 400 a month. Okay. And, or she can do a combination thereof. Now, the way they're written in reverse mortgage is when the last spouse leaves the home for a year or longer, and typically they go to an old age home, an assisted living home, hospital, sorry, they die. Then the house is inherited and the kids have a choice. Pay off the mortgage, whatever amount she borrowed. So it was a HELOC. It's not if she didn't use it, they don't owe it, okay? If she were to move out and still be alive, but it'd be an assisted living for three years, the house would have to be sold or the, the mortgage replaced. Maybe the kids want to turn it into a rental and they get a financing loan and they take out the reverse mortgage, you follow? But it's it's got to be settled up, okay? okay. So now, like, for example, my so let's say my grandmother gets a reverse mortgage, she passes away. I want to take the property back. I want to turn it into a rental. We owe 150,000, like you said, that was what was borrowed. I would then just apply for a mortgage of 150,000, pay it back, and I would reassume the ownership of the home. Well, you would inherit the home. Got it. But it'd be subject to the to the uh, reverse mortgage. It's almost and a lien wanted, on the and property. They want, see, it's stipulated by her. They want to be paid. Yes. For example, if she just had a regular mortgage you might be able to go into the lender and say, I'm the grandson, I inherited, I'd like to take the mortgage over. Can we do that? They may do that, right. but not with a reverse. It's time to settle up. Now, the, one of the most not asked questions is, but 300,000 is the value, she borrows 150 and the market tanks when she dies. It just happens to be a bad period. And, and the market property is worth 120. I'm stuck paying that difference. No, you're not. The lenders get stuck with it. So the heirs will never be stuck with an unpaid mortgage, reverse mortgage. Right. That isn't, that isn't how it works. Now, I tell people this as well. Is if your grandmother's house was 300000 and she took a reverse mortgage for one fifty and died, I let's say, hopefully, 15 more years, okay? Is her house going to be worth more probably the same or less, it'd be worth more. Yeah. So it'd be worth more than 300. So Ryan, who inherits it, will be picking up some of that equity because with a reverse mortgage, if you take a lump sum, it's accruing interest every month. If you take payments, at first it's minimal, $500 a month. A year later, it's only 6,000. But if she lives 15, 20 years, it could be a sizable amount. The point is they have no payments. And I will use my friend, I told you as an illustration. Because of her income, she's retired, okay? She, the, the lender will only give her 250,000. She's moved, she moved to LA, okay? San Fernando Valley of LA. And she's buying a condominium for 675,000. The bank's telling her, we'll only loan 250, period, because of your income. She has an 850 FICO, killer. 
right. but she only has an income to support 250. Okay. She's got to put 400 some thousand down. She doesn't want to do it. It's her money. It's her life. She doesn't want to do a mortgage. She's in her seventies, do a mortgage, say for 60%, which would be about a 360, $400,000 mortgage. Okay. Not 250 maybe four, that would leave her 150,000 of her cash to leave in the bank for other needs and purposes. Yeah. Okay. But that's not unusual. I have a friend who bought a movie theater years ago, paid 150,000, sold it for a million 250 to Quentin Tarantino. And he had a million one exposure. And I explained it to him and he says, I don't care. I don't want to fool. I don't want rental property again. I don't want to be involved. He took the tax hit and he sold it. That's fine. That's fine. We're not going to convince everyone, but by a long shot. But for you or me as realtors, I was there when he said no, but let's list it and sell it. Yeah. So I still benefited by giving him a solution or an option. I got the listings. You see where I'm going with that? So realtors don't get discouraged and say, well, if they don't do it, I get nothing. There's nothing I gain out of this. That's not necessarily true at all. In fact, there'll be cases where not only do you sell the house they're in and it's exchanged, you sell them the house or refer. I think you had one in Portland, you said, for an example, that went all the way to Oregon, that you would share in that because you referred it. So it is a money-making, commission-generating plan if handled, and as you know, I'm doing a program on that now for realtors to generate listings because you want to know something, realtors? There's no competition. There's no one out there going after these people. Yeah, and what's great is it's not even that there's no competition. I mean, there needs to be some competition because yes, you, could does. Really, you could really be saving, like you could be saving people a ton of money, helping them grow their wealth that they didn't even know that they could be growing. I mean, that's what, when I, like I said, when I first talked to you about this, it was like, holy crap. Because like, I've seen so many of my clients that I didn't even bring it up yet because it wasn't really something that I even thought about, you know, they were ready to list, like you said, one of their rentals, just because the market is where it is right now, specifically, they're like, I'm selling at the top. This is going to be freaking awesome. And now we're having larger discussions. Well, hey, if you want to sell the top, why don't you, are, are you still wanting to be in the business? Some people are just like, I'm done. Let me out. Right. So I don't right. want to be a landlord anymore. I don't want to deal with this management company anymore. I just want to sell it and take the profits. That's cool. But some people don't know that they can do other things. And that's why I'm so glad that we are uh, able to talk to clients and also other realtors to kind of start expanding this knowledge for them. Well, a quick thing too, about management or I don't want the hassles. What is it? Tenant toilets and taxes or three T's or whatever. I understand that, but uh, someone could sell and have a, a nice chunk of equity, half a million, a million, million and a half, but they don't want to get into rentals. They could invest in a tick tenant and common building. It could be a triple net grade a building at the post office is an anchor tenant. Otherwise, it can be quality, it can be longevity, it's professional. Now, the liquidity is, is an issue uh, as compared to having the money in the bank, as is you're not going to get uh, the 10, 20, 30% returns or something like that. It's, it's going to beat a uh, uh, bank account, 2% interest, but there are options of what they might get into that's much more passive. I also call it going from junkers, uh, you might have a client, this is not uncommon, it's acquired three homes and all of them over the years have been somewhat problematic, okay? But he's done okay, appreciation has been kind. Get rid of that and get a single family home, a duplex your mother or grandmother would live in. I mean, a really nice unit. I've seen those, I've owned those, tenants been there 20 years. Yeah. They've remodeled at their expense. I'm just saying this incredible tenants, other end of the bell curve, the tenant from hell, these are the tenants from heaven that <laughs> you, you, you can move into. Yeah. And then my last thing on that is I love, and I call it the story of the buffalo hunters. And the buffalo hunters are in Colorado and the wives come out about once a month in the buckboard and they got some provisions and uh, the hot biscuits or whatever that makes the guys happy. And the wives are noticing that when they're coming out now, the, the husbands have fewer and fewer buffalo skins. They're always complaining, there's no more buffalo. 
And, uh, so you don't even see him anymore. And there, Wiser saying, I hear there's lots of them in Wyoming, not yeah. Colorado. Why don't you move? Well, I'm saying to someone, don't be so headstrong to say, I live in Laguna Beach, it's got to be down the street. Try to maybe have a little broader vision, or at least look at some of the numbers. And there are a lot of places you could buy a beautiful little brick fourplex or whatever, two, three hundred thousand, four or five would be just, could be a doctor's office. Yep. Okay. And maybe it's in Oklahoma, whatever. And it's a triple net lease, whatever. If you want to stay where you are, San Francisco, LA, New York City, Laguna Beach, is you're going to pay to play. It, it, they're not going to be great investments. If they don't appreciate, you're in trouble because they're negative. Why would you pay a million dollars for something that produced 5,000 a month rent? Yeah. When you can pay 500,000 to get something that pays 7,000 a month rent. My biggest score was in Wyoming and I bought a 14 unit apartment house. People bought it and rehabbed it. And I paid 260,000, Ryan, for a 14 unit, all one bedrooms. Now, a couple of things I just think make it work terrifically. One was one of the units was occupied and she got free rent by the local police dispatcher. That's who you want. If there's any noise in the units, whatever she just calls one of the squad cars, they come over and pay a visit. You can't ask for a better manager than that. I paid 260 and flipped it the next day for, it was, I think, 320, I mean, 60,000. Okay, but what really rests on is, Tom, what was their rentals? What were their rentals? Their rentals were 4,300 a month. Nice. Very Huge. nice. Huge. Yeah. Huge. The cap rate goes off the table. The, the <laughs> clothes. Okay. So my Buffalo story, they may be somewhere else. Now you may look around and after you do and you make a conclusion, not for me, I understand. But yeah. at least don't close the door on that possibility. Yeah, I know right now, personally, I'm looking for my first rental and I've been um, I've been scouring everywhere <laughs> in uh, California and I'm really excited about the opportunity. But then I was uh, speaking to the in-laws and they live in Illinois and they're realtors as well. They actually just opened their own brokerage even. Good for and them. yeah, they're, they're they're just booming in business. And uh, they were like, why would you buy there? Why don't you come buy from us? And, it, you know, like. You might be thinking, oh, well, they just want the business or whatever. But no, they have, they've got, I mean, you can buy oh. something there in Illinois, like small town, not Chicago, small town. We're talking 50 to 150,000 in that Absolutely. range. Absolutely. And you could be collecting 1,500 to 2,500 rent, depending on, you know, what's, what part of Illinois and, uh, and things like that. So that's what I'm looking, I mean, because you can get a 500 to $700,000 home year to collect two grand rent. With there, you're looking at a hundred grand. It's like, come on. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, I've sold in Illinois, Indiana, New Jersey, where I'm talking about out of the major cities, yeah. uh, uh, or Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, I went through that one time, like Sherman marching to the sea and found some fabulous units, whatever, for about a fifth of what they were. That's why I went to Wyoming, by the way. When I went to Wyoming, I lived in Denver. I couldn't find, I called them Titanic Investments. Okay, they're about a half a percent of what you pay in rent. So that means if that 14 unit was 320,000, they were collecting 1600 rent, that'd be a Titanic. Yeah. It was producing 4,300, okay? And I totally agree with you. My only caution with the Northeast is it's cold. Mm -hmm. You have boilers, you have uh, heating oil. I'm just saying, if it's an older house, da, 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 you gotta be real careful because you can get stung you know, with the maintenance or whatever on it, but there are definitely units. I, I love when I'm in a colder city like that, wherever it's, it's Philadelphia, it's, 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 uh, in Ohio, whatever, uh, Illinois, Indiana, I love brick homes. Yeah. They stayed at the times. I mean, it could be a hundred year old home. Uh, has it been updated with uh, maybe air conditioning or heating, but the point being, it's not going to have the same, uh, susceptibilities, uh as as something that's wood frame or whatever same thing in the south i like the south i love uh georgia i love several areas oh you can buy stuff you won't believe i tend to stay away from stick built because of termites not the cold but sometimes you go in there and you realize that the building's ready to fall over but i've seen homes in georgia that are 
60,000, 70,000 brick. They might pull, nothing huge, they might pull 850 rent. But if your IRA buys this, or you have a CD getting 2%, just do the math. Yeah. Whatever. No, it, make, it, make, it makes a great deal. And once again, the part of that is getting comfortable with it and exploring it. And as you explore it, you're going to get, you know, more and more excited. So my suggestion is there, and I assume they might do it, is if you bought or in their town, is that they manage it. Don't think that someone mailing you checks, you're saving 10%. And then also, of course, a killer inspection. You know, yeah. Heating, all that stuff. Yeah. That you're not moving into something that's going to cost you a bundle. But yeah, they, we, that's what we've discussed too, because they have a couple of rentals themselves. They have a management company that they know, use and trust. And um, that really goes well. And then also you, you kind of hinted at our next episode. So uh, for those of you that are not subscribed yet, make sure you click that subscribe button, but we'll be getting into the IRA uh, and talking about how to use IRAs properly and, and things of that nature. Uh, for real estate. Next, you know. <laughs> yeah right for real estate for okay. real estate yeah not to buy a wall street but we'll also cover 401k yeah and there's the company 401k which by the way i know we've talked about someone in your family that has a 401k at an ex-employer and i think i told you i read an article i was shocked there is one trillion dollars in 401k company 401ks that the people have left the employment yeah that's and, it's, it's incredible. And you, you can argue both sides, but a big downside of that is you have real no knowledge of what's happening with the company, the plan administrator, what's going on. Okay. Uh, if it happened to be an IBM stock, you can still move it into your present 401k. I don't suggest that, but you could and move it over. At least you can see what's going on more. But for realtors, again, that's a trillion alone. Company 401ks, there's eight trillion. Yeah. Iris in our teaser for next episode, there's eleven trillion dollars in Iris, and Wall Street's got ninety-five percent of it. So we realtors have our work cut out for us. Yeah, and of course, our channel is not about financial advice; it's just education. We still want you to do your own due diligence on all of these things. But a lot of people are leaving stuff on the table and things. Now, Tom, we also were talking about some art, right? So um, yeah. I know you wanted to get into a little story about art where you and I are both really big in art. Like you said, Laguna Beach, a, a, a mecca oh. of art. It is great. They have the greatest creators here. Uh, my girlfriend, she is a phenomenal artist. I know you've actually owned galleries, sold galleries. Jamie, uh, my girlfriend's owned galleries and been a great salesperson with art and uh, as an artist herself. So I know you wanted to uh, touch some art topics today. So let's go ahead and uh, segue over there. Well, a couple of quick things. Uh, I read an article, kind of triggered it, uh, art is an inflation hedge. And it's one of the best uh, investment tools out there. And I'm talking about gold, bitcoins, whatever. Uh, I'm old enough that I remember trying to sell. I worked for a gallery in Beverly Hills that carried original impressionist works. We're talking about oil, or Renoir, Monet, whatever they got. And I tried to sell a film producer um, a Monet water lilies, and it was, uh, gosh, what was it, 850000 and he offered 500000 and the owner said no, and uh, he walked, it happens, and it recently, about a year ago, sold at Sotheby's for $29 million. Jeez. So uh, it's got to be the right kind of art, it's got to be good art. Collecting art as a hedge against inflation or for an investment is totally different than what aesthetically you like or don't like. When I deal with someone on that and I've counseled people, they put that, just put it out of your mind. Uh, I may show you stuff that does not appeal to you, but you want bottom line safety, liquidity. And for example, I was just looking at some things from the regionalists. The regionalists, you go back to Bellows or Grant Wood or you know, the Ashcan School, John Sloan, you can't buy a painting. Uh, I think at Edward Hopper, night, uh, uh, Diner at Night, I forget what it's called. Oh, his famous painting. But anyway, it brought $110 million. But they have graphics out there. They died a long time ago. These things have been out there. And you can buy for $1,200, $1,500. You, you can start a collection of maybe a school of artists that you, I think you'd enjoy them if you saw them. Yeah, office somewhere, guest bedroom. Okay. Another approach would be 
that I told you in Laguna Beach is one, you go in and you talk to people, you talk in, in galleries. The thing about that that's tough is that's almost like saying, Ryan, you go in and buy a brand new BMW and then you drive down the street to another BMW dealer and you think he's going to give you what you paid for it. Right. It's not. He's got overhead. The prior dealer has to make a nice cushion, okay, of money. It's understandable. They got rent to pay, salespeople, whatever. So you might buy Sam or Sally Smith in a gallery there, but right away you're at a disadvantage. And that's why for something like that, I say buy what you enjoy because it's on your wall. You enjoy. I have artwork behind me. I've had 30, 35 years and it's gone from $1,000 to $30,000. Okay. And the artist didn't become rich and famous, just known and collectible. And then my favorite with you, and I'll end it with this because we'll spend more time on it, but is go to a college in your town. Say, do you have an oil painting class, acrylic oil? Yes, we do. Do you have a point where you have an exhibition? Or could I come in at the end of the semester and see their final works and would it be rude for me to offer to buy them? If they say that's not our protocol, yes, it would be whatever. Say, well, I appreciate that, thank you, okay? But if not, go in and see. Now, college already, they're gonna probably want a thousand or more, 2000, okay? I'm talking about a pretty substantial painting though. If that doesn't work, go to a high school. And you would be shocked. You may go through a few and say, wow, where well, there's some real amateurish or, you know, those weren't so red hot. But you might find something, wow, she or he is really knows how to make a statement. They're going somewhere with this. Dot, da, 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 da. You can buy it for hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And I really prefer that than you go into a gallery. I call them the graphics type galleries. And uh, in fact, I wrote a book once called The Paper Hangers. Uh, because of these multiples and you're paying an exorbitant amount of money for something that has very little liquidity. I'm talking about, you might pay 15,000 for a Peter Max, okay? Or someone that's known, but you could do so much better and diversify better by going out and trying to buy original somewhere than a multiple graphic like that. Yeah, it's kind of like what you were just saying too. So not only is the gallery that you're buying it from have brick and mortar to pay rent, lights, electricity, and so on. Uh, they only get a percentage of what the artist gets and vice versa going directly to the artist. They don't lose that commission. You know, some galleries charge 30, 40, 50% commission. 50. Yeah. So let's say, for example, you do know a local artist or, or you, you're able to connect mm -hmm. with an artist online via, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, right. Instagram, whatever, versus going to the gallery. One, you get to build a relationship with the artist, see if you like them. Because, you know, a lot of times when it comes to buying art, you're buying the artist, not necessarily the art, right? So a lot of times it's that. And like you said, too, there's two different types of art. There's uh, retail art that could be investments later on, but mm -hmm. then there's also the investment market. So there are two different markets and you got to, you know, do some research uh, and uh, know that, like you were just saying. So be aware of what you're, what you're learning about art and where you're buying it and who you're buying it from. One of my best experiences, I own an art gallery in Sedona, Arizona. You ever been to Sedona? It's I've not been there, no. Fabulous, okay. Gallery Telesis, and it was a co-op gallery. And I had, I think, 4,000 square feet, and I had 50 artists. When you walked in, it had the price of the painting clearly displayed. I'd tell you about the artist. I didn't make a dime if the painting sold. Well, you say, Tom, how did you stay open? because the artists paid to hang their works. Yeah. And either they have faith in themselves or they don't. And I was professional to sell works for them. Okay. And I remember a case of a painting was a thousand dollars from quite a while ago. And the guy offered 900 and I said, is that your Rolls Royce outside? And it was, he said, yeah. I said, so a hundred dollar bill is keeping this piece from going to your home. A hundred dollar bill, and look how successful you are. I can't believe that the guy wouldn't budge. So I said, Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to stand in the middle. Let me call the artist. And I called the artist. I said, Talk to the guy. The artist wouldn't come down a hundred, he wouldn't go up a hundred. My wife loved the painting, so I bought it for her, and we still <laughs> have it. Right. Okay. But what I liked, and this is what's so important, 
I would share the if back then emails was not as, as well known back then, it was recipient stage, but definitely phone number or whatever. This is Bill Brown. Here's his number, whatever. He loved your work, but not quite that one or whatever. The case. And that artist could build a database. Yeah. 10 names, 50 names, 100 names. And eventually paint an orchid, the Black Panther, you call it what you want to abstract, send a, a, a file, a picture to all 50 or 500 people who are interested in his or her work. And that artist ultimately can just about eliminate the need for gallery representation, unless you're getting in their real serious art. And that's a whole nother episode. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, once you end up in museums. Yeah. Well, what you were just saying too about um, with building a list, you know, a lot of artists getting into it too are so um, into the image of an artist. It's bohemian. It's living the life. They don't. They're like, I don't want to be a marketer. I don't want to collect people's emails. I don't want to do this. I don't want to sell it. I don't want to do anything. <laughs> but, but the times have changed, and collecting an email is not as invasive as people think it is and if you if if they do love your art if you're having a conversation with someone they see a piece of your art you need their email so you can keep sending them the stuff that they like i mean that's why you send them an email once a month with your new piece or once a week however frequent and how fast you can produce but show your work to the people that are interested in seeing it. it's instant i i think vincent van gogh if he had a computer on the internet probably would have sold a few uh, and I'm not taking advantage and in, in, uh, in safety and the fact he's so well established and resilience. I'm talking about even then. Yeah. I think he, he, well, he wouldn't have gotten away all by purity and all this other stuff. Okay, the ultimate compliment for an artist, you know what it is? Not Ryan, you look younger than I thought, you're more handsome. It's you, someone writes Ryan a check. That's 100%. the ultimate compliment for an artist, okay? And uh, the artist, tend to forget that. But I think sometimes that's like I have friends that write and five years later, they haven't finished the last chapter because if they do, now it's time to go submit that script or that novel and probably get a lot of rejections. Yeah, okay. it's hard. It's, that's the hardest part too, you know? Because yes. especially for an artist, they love the creation of art. That's why they're an artist. The sales part is not exciting for them. And that, I, and I've seen it. I've, I've met tons of artists now mm -hmm. and that is the hard part for them. And that's why they do try to get representation and things. But um, if you if you can, if, as an artist, you can combine both. It's just amazing how 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 well you can do. Well, I, I represented someone for a while Francoise Gillot. And Francoise Gillot uh, was Picasso's mistress in German occupied Paris in the 40s. And I represented her in the 70s. And I asked her once, I said, Tell me true, Francois. I said, Did you and Pablo ever talk about how important a title was of a painting? She said, Absolutely. He may want to call it three vases, but they say Chanel Trois or something like that. They come up with something that's more exciting. Right. Uh, what have you. Artists don't like that, then get someone else to do it for you. Yeah. And I don't that's know what of, else to say. That's part of the buyer experience, right? Like it's got to have a unique name and things. And you know, what's interesting is most artists are so creative. They can come up with such a brilliant name for their piece. It's just um, sometimes they can't figure it out. You know, they right. Well, you'll see untitled, but it still brings 200 million or something. When I had my gallery in Palm Springs, I had a gallery in Palm Springs, California. Uh, occasionally I'd get an artist come in pretty cocky, whatever. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's let's just cut to the chase. Uh, I want 10 grand a month here. This is going back a ways in several decades. I want 10 grand a month. That covers me, my personal overhead and covers my gallery overhead. So I'll tell you what, forget me. You hang your paintings as dense as you want, spaced like you want. You pay for your own caterer. You come in and you host it and you keep 100%. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. Put up or shut up. Right. Okay. Because I had a beautiful gallery. They loved it. I, in fact, I was written up in the Times and a whole bunch of things about catering. It was phenomenal. I had all the movie stars coming in. But anyway, I never had an artist take me up on that. Otherwise, he or she could have the whole enchilada. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they didn't do it. Well, it's that's a scary, uh, it's a scary uh, ultimatum to be in, you know. So I get. Well, it's it. like a parent. Two things you don't want to hear from a child: Hey, Dad, I want to be an artist. Hey, Dad, <laughs> I want to be an actor. 
Yeah. No, maybe third is a realtor. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, anything with that. Uh, whatever. But it's it's fabulous. You know what I mean? When you get you get bitten by the bug and collect and you start you know, uh, assembling a, a collection, whatever, and you enjoy them on the wall. I have artwork I've had 30 years that I still look at. I won't say every day, but you better believe every time I pass it, I'll stop and look at it. Yeah. Well, that's one thing interesting about art collectors that I've met. You go to their house and there's more art on the floor than on the wall because they just keep buying it because they love art. Right. You know? it, they don't say, in fact, one of my favorite salesman comebacks, and you'll appreciate this, is I would talk to someone, I say, you ought to have it for your collection. We don't have any room left. I said, well, we do room expansions. <laughs> And just be quiet. And sometimes they laugh. Sometimes they didn't know what to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll do a room edition. We'll add it. I have. I had uh, artwork at my kids' home. We had it in storage. We couldn't hang it all. Yeah. If if you really and we weren't collecting for investment. We were collecting because we liked it and had the income to buy something. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest things you may have in your house now is you travel. And you buy a painting and you're at home, you're looking at a painting or a friend comments on it. You say, yeah, my wife and got that. And I got that when we were in Mexico. We got that when we were in Paris. We got that when we were in Moscow, whatever. But it, it, memories. It brings yeah. memory. Far longer than probably most cars you've ever purchased. Yeah, and it's cool because those will also have your emotion attached to it, right? Because that memory will be so strong because you remember the coffee you were drinking when you saw the artist that was making yep. it on the street that it was being made on. And then you got to go take it literally while I was still wet and yep. uh, things of that nature, too, which is really cool. Oh, artists are interesting people. They can be irascible. They can be modest or meek. In fact, I'll show you sometime. I just saw an artist that I had recommended to people when she was six to ten thousand. Uh, she's now at two hundred thousand, and that's at auction. Nice. And she reminds me she took a path that I, an artist I helped build, did not take. More uh, museum type art, whatever. But you would enjoy it if you saw it. I'll send you some copies of the of the of the pictures. Uh, and I, I keep thinking back. This artist I know could have gone that path that she chose to be. And that's fine. Uh, pretty, uh, not confrontational. And people like them, the candy, I guess, art candy. And who wouldn't like it and that, this and that and whatever. Uh, and that's, that's just a choice an artist has to make. Absolutely. Well, hey, Tom, this has been a great uh, conversation for our very first episode, our basically trailer episode. So if anybody wants to get in touch with Tom or myself, you can visit our website at www.realestatebrainstormingpodcast.com. And that will uh, lead you to our landing page. Go ahead and leave your name and your best email and phone number there. And we'll be able to get in touch with you. If you're a realtor you're looking for some information, reach out to us. If you're a customer looking to move or relocate to Laguna Beach or the surrounding areas, also reach out to us really anywhere in the country, we can help you. And uh, Tom, do you have any last words? Yeah, my last words are simply this. Sometimes realtors think, well, I got to know about IRAs to approach someone, uh, whatever, our 401ks or 1031 exchanging. Uh, uh, I'll work with you, get a hold of that person, just have a quick five minute call and I'll be glad to kind of carry the ball for you until you get comfortable enough that you can do it yourself, not become an IRA expert or a 1031 exchange expert, but don't use that as an excuse or something from keeping you of learning more and having a whole new field of prospecting. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so very much for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one. Don't forget to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.